how long should we be using hormonal therapy if we're using it in a neoadjuvant fashion with high-risk prostate cancer? And if we go beyond six months, a year, two or three years, what's going to be the negative effects of doing that? We've had a, a fair number of papers, which I'll show you, that talk about death rates. So why did we do this? So this is the Michelle Bola study, the RTC study, that randomized patients between no hormones and three years of hormones, keeping the mind those days the dose was 70 gray, that sort of set the stage for two to three years along with the RTOG studies. Michelle Bola is in Grenoble, France. I trained him on how to do brachytherapy years ago. So I can remember being in, in his hospital and we're training the radiation oncologists and urologists and we're I'm telling him about the high doses. And he turns to me and goes, Nelson, Everything is not about seed implant. We still have to have external beam radiation. I think I was too, too enthusiastic. All right, type of hormones. We have the three, three types. And what about testosterone recovery? Because when you take a man who's got a normal testosterone, he wants to know that testosterone is gonna come back to normal. Uh, and if it doesn't, we need to tell our patient what factors can influence the return of testosterone. And there are a lot of reasons I'll show you. And, and what we now know is that older patients and men on ADT for a longer period of time are less likely to recover their T. So I'll show you a few studies. Um, here's one from Japan where they randomize, then randomized, they looked at their patients and they divide them into three years or greater, neoadjuvant hormonal therapy, or up to one year. And what they showed is the likelihood of recovering your testosterone back to supercastrate levels was greatly decreased if you got three years of hormonal therapy versus six months. So six months of hormonal therapy, almost everybody recovered within a year. Three years, it's only 40%. So if you're doing a year or 18 months, it's gonna be somewhere in between according to this data. Uh, here's a, another study where they developed a nomogram for recovery for um, combined androgen deprivation and radiation therapy. And on the multivariate analysis, let's look and see what's significant. So the duration of ADT, just like the last time, they also measured baseline testosterone and found that baseline testosterones are significant. So we never typically measured baseline testosterone, but now I think it's probably a good idea because now there's data emerging showing you need to look at the baseline testosterone and consider um, maybe shortening the term if the individuals is low. And they also looked at BMI and found that was significant. And here is the difference between testosterone recovery for the short term and the long term. Again, it's retarded with longer therapy. What about cardiovascular disease? So th this is a bit of a black box, I think, because you see a lot of papers, and some say yes, and some say no. This is a meta-analysis showing a forest plot. These are randomized controlled studies. These are observational studies. So the line would say no increased risk. So in the randomized trials, there's a number that say no increased risk for cardiovascular disease, and a few that say there are. And then the observational studies are mostly positive, but not a big effect. Here's a study that tried to look at the cardiovascular events based on no previous history of cardiovascular disease, history of cardiovascular disease, and a number of events. And this is a GnRH agonist, this is uh, antiandrogens, and this is orchiectomy. I mean, you can see this sort of all over the place. You can see, oh well, yeah, there's some studies. The bottom line from this was that if you had one event, you were at increased risk. If you had two events, you were not at increased risk, probably because you had as many events if you didn't get it. And it was kind of a black box if you had no uh, prior events, the blue line, because it doesn't really change much from baseline. So that didn't, wasn't very helpful. Here's a very large study showing uh, survival in 18,000 men who received 75.6 gray, plus or minus. And you can see, we thought maybe with age, no difference here. Here is the uh, eight year overall survival between the radiation and ADT broken up by Charleston scores, by age groups. None of these are significant in this study. So one thing to pay attention to is time. 
All these studies have a short follow-up. And remember, just like I showed you with the urinary symptoms, you don't see much at 10 years. It's really 15 years you start to see stuff, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Here's um, Amy Dosaret's study with Anthony D'Amico showing that in men who were older had an increased risk of mortality if they received hormonal therapy versus hormonal therapy versus no hormonal therapy with radiation. So they had a positive study in terms of that effect. Here's a pooled analysis, again, this is from D'Amico, of 311 men enrolled in three trials who received six months or three years of hormones for locally advanced prostate cancer. No difference. Again, but it's eight years. No difference in eight years. We need to be publishing these things at 15 years. So going back to uh, what I had showed you originally with our data, here, here is the dose relationship that we discovered early on when we converted our doses to the BED. And the reason I'm showing you this is how we have never been able to show that hormonal therapy has a benefit when you give high dose radiation. Despite the fact that we adopted the strategy from the URTC and RTOG, although our strategy was nine months of hormones, not two or three years, because we gave the hormones coincidentally with the delivery of the radiation. So we didn't want to continue it beyond the time radiation was being given. Because my feeling was, Richard and I, when we discussed this in 1993, is yes, hormonal therapy may have an added effect on the tumor when you're delivering the radiation. And we didn't know this because in 93, we only had two years of dosimetry results and no outcome results. But I personally didn't believe that giving hormone therapy longer was going to affect those patients who may have had micrometastases at the time. And if you looked at the uh, breast cancer literature, you really needed to take tamoxifen for five years to get the benefit, and we're not giving hormones for five years. So we limited the dose to nine months, and maybe that's why we didn't see an advantage. But uh, I don't think that's the answer. I just don't, I think if you give enough dose, maybe you don't need hormonal therapy at all. But be that as may, we've never been able to show that hormones has, has a benefit in outcomes. So I published this a couple years ago, 15-year cause-specific survival and all-cause survival and the impact of hormonal therapy on all-cause survival, and so 94% alive at 15 years by Kaplan Meyer. And when you looked at the prostate cancer deaths, there were 37 prostate cancer deaths, but most of them were in the high risk. There were very few deaths in the low and intermediate risk disease. But when you looked, and when you dichotomize the data from whether or not they got six months of hormonal therapy versus more than six months, from zero to six months versus more than six months, you see the substantial difference in all-cause survival at 15 years is 57.8% for the non-hormonal therapy versus 51.3% for those men who had more than six months. Why? Again, we don't know why. So now we've drilled down. We presented this last year at the AUA and in the process of getting it written. 1,776 men followed a minimum of six years. So now we got really nice, long follow-up. Mean is over 10 years. Hormonal therapy was given to a little over half for a median of six months, 75th percentile, three to nine months. We had t testosterone levels in a 64%, so we got a robust database. And the testosterone levels were taken a mean median of six years after completion of therapy. And we looked at all the comorbidities, because we got them in the database, including diabetes, coronary artery disease, alcohol use, et cetera. And we looked at associations between death and all of these factors, so binary analysis. So now we have 17-year survival, zero to six months. This is all-cost survival, zero to six months versus greater than six months. You look at the mean survival. It's easy to look at that. So you can say you lose two years of life by taking more than six months of hormonal therapy. That's how you would interpret the data. Uh, if you exclude the men on salvage, because about 100 of those men were taking hormonal therapy because they failed, so let's get rid of all those men, and basically these are the men who haven't failed, you still see a substantial difference, 16.9, you lose 
6.8 years of life by being on hormonal therapy more than six months. Age, of course, is always going to be significant because the older you are, the more you're lucky you're going to die. Diabetes was uh, significant. And look at testosterone level. If the person's testosterone level was less than 300 versus more than 300, so this is the cut point for normal testosterone in our lab, you lost 1.3 years of life if you had a lower testosterone. So this is uh, the likelihood of recovering testosterone above 300, and you can see based on hormonal therapy dichotomization. So again, zero to six months of hormones, 81.6% recovered their testosterone above the 300 versus 68.3% if they got more than six months of hormonal therapy. You look at the uh, Cox regression, the last hormonal therapy just comes in as significant at 0.47 along with age. So is this an explanation as to why men who get longer term hormonal therapy live less time than those who get less time? Is it because their testosterones are suppressed? I think that's very provocative and we need to do more research, but that's certainly not an unreasonable uh, uh, assessment given all what we know about men with low testosterone and the likelihood of developing core morbidities. This is one of the reasons why I started thinking I'm doing everything possible to cure this patient of prostate cancer and then I'm making him die earlier because of what I'm giving him. So something to think about when you're trying to decide how much hormonal therapy to give a patient. So with that we're going to end this session and I thank you all for attending what I think was a very successful scientific program. Thank you.